full disclosure, um, I know I said I would do a shorter one this time. Yeah, that's um, not true. <laughs> oh, no, it is shorter <laughs> by 100 words. It's, it's 10,400 mm. words instead of 500. Um, <laughs> did we have any questions? So, 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 so far we've covered Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira. And Thyatira. Now, yeah. we've, we've gone through where we, st- we saw the start of Ephesus, where Ephesus was the, the capital city. We moved into Smyrna, where we saw that they were starting to evolve and develop. And then we had Jezebel in Pergamum, and we moved into the long slog of Thyatira. Um, was there anything we needed to go back over with those? Was there anything we re- needed to recover or, or, or re-examine at all? The only thing when I was reading through it, those, <laughs> I went to that site you gave us, that Xerxes yep. information. Were they sure that that was Xerxes that wrote all that or was that? Uh, it's, it's Xerxes claiming to, to write it. Whether or not he actually sat down with a pen and wrote it or whether he sort of had one of his officials issue it in his name is up for grabs, but it's certainly him claiming to be it. So it is that Xerxes, and it is him claiming to to have done all those things and to have taken on the Babylonian um, priests and the, and having a Babylonian uprising. So it's it's definitely in his name, if that makes sense. So when he says that the... Let me get that one so up. So was that Satanism or something that they were... He's calling it demons, but that's yeah. the wrong, the, probably the wrong word to use. So when he says that they are demons and, and that sort of thing, what he's referring to is no, groups that are outside of his church. So let me just demon. Because when he calls, uh, what was his god? Uh, Asmarunda. Yeah. Uh, Asmarunda. There it is. Asmarunda. Yep. So as he first says, because it, well, well, I thought I read that he said, that has Marunda is the only God, the one that made man and everything. So is that just another name for God or No, that's a name for his God. He was a pagan. He wasn't so a follower it's still of Jews. A, it's, so it's still a pagan yeah. idol. Yeah. So this is Xerxes fight with yeah, his yeah. god, his, his Persian god, fighting against these um Babylonian divas, demons. Yes. Uh, and he's claiming that his god, Ahaz Marunda, is the the top god he's not claiming the the jewish god or our god he's claiming that their god was the top god so that's what i was under the impression they had multiple gods they did but they had they had a primacy they had an organization to them so while uh, they did right have 48 i think it was 49 gods in their hierarchy um yep. for them ahaz marunda was one of the senior ones yeah, fair in, this, in no. the same way, when you come to Greece, you have um, Zeus as the senior god. Uh, in Rome, Ju- Jupiter is the senior Jupiter. god. You have mm. you have a hierarchy to them. Yeah. Right. Fair enough. No, that's that was we, all that bit. I was we ready. went over a lot of stuff. So that's why I want to make sure we're okay. Is, is yeah. any other questions? Anything else we need to cover back from that? What about you, John? No, I'm I'm real proud of David for coming up with that question. It's a beauty. Yeah. David's David's certainly on the ball here, so this is good. I uh, I know. I'm, I'm thinking he's elder material. Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Don't go there. <laughs> yeah. Well, in fairness, John, we got to deal with Laodicea today, so let's wait and see how he feels at the end of this study before he goes there. Um, all right. So chapter three. Now it throws itself back in. Chapter two and three really should be connected. Well, really are connected. We go straight from Thyatira to Sidus. So we're, we're writing to the next church down. And as I said, they sort of go in a bit of a, a loop. I don't think there's much to that, but we're moving down to this next church in, in Sardis. And it says, To the angel of Sardis writes, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name and you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain and that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you like a thief. You will not know what hour I will come to you. You have a few names even in Sardis that have not defiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father, and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, Sardis was the capital of Lydia. We've talked a bit about Lydia in our in our Paul study. Uh, and the Lydian Empire existed from about 1200 to 544 BC, uh, 546 BC. 
when it became part of the Ahmadinejad uh, Persian Empire, and then it was part of that group we were talking about in Daniel 11 that was given to the Roman Empire in 133. Uh, Alexander conquered it entirely in 334. Then it became part of the Seleucid Empire, and after the Seleucid Empire, it was dissolved and it went to Lydia. It was very, very rich, and it was very strategically placed. So in its location here, it actually sits on the, on the, on the border of a couple of um, trading routes, um, one that goes into Philadelphia heavily. But it's so important a strategic place, and if you look at where it just is in this Italian lo uh, in this Turkish location, you can see that it's right in the center of everything. And it was so important. Remember, we talked about the proconsuls and the leaders of Rome. This yep. is one of those spots that actually had a proconsulship. So all of this area would have been governed from Sardis. So it's a senior political hub. It's where everybody comes for politics. Now, because of this, um, Ephesus, while Ephesus was the center of the Christian world, Sardis was more the center of the politic world. So when you came to present your court case to the proconsul, you came and presented it in Sardis. And the major of the commentary of this church is rather bland. It's unspecific. It says, be watchful and strengthen. I know your works. I know that you're alive, but I know that you're dead. There's not much to this church in terms of proselytizing. There's not much to this church in terms of heresy. It seems to be a rather bland message to this group. So the church experienced some per periodic persecution, as we've talked about with others. But in the ancient world, this would have been a political center. So this would have been where anybody that was accused of heresy or anybody that was accused of uh, trying to overthrow Rome would have been brought for a message. And so there's a lot of that sort of interesting things um, in, in terms of this church. Now, it's noteworthy that Milito of Sardis was the first person to actually uh, coin the Testament, Old Testament phrase, and he's the one who set up the list of books that uh, became the Old Testament. And he included... Uh, excluded both Estra and the Apocrypha. So this is where the church actually established, or the, the, the gospel as we have it today, established what would go into the Old Testament. So those that are ready to die, I have fa not found your works perfect before God. This is one of those hubs where a lot of things happened in the early church that were not happy for God. He wasn't happy that bits and pieces of the Old Testament were being eliminated. He wasn't happy for these things. But nevertheless, he the, the church was secure. Now, the authority reference is simply Christ reminding everyone that he is God. There's no fluff here. There's an element of fatherly warmth, right? I am the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, right? He is the, He's giving an element of fatherly warmth here, but there's not a lot of fluff in this sort of term. <clears throat> and interestingly, this is the one of the only two churches that has no condemnation. He says he knows their works and they're good, but he says the church is dead. The church is simply plodding along, they're simply moving forward in time. They are just continuing. But those works are not perfect. The warning is for those who've devoted themselves to Jesus to remain on guard and be vigilant because they can partake in the future rewards. He's saying that his judgment is coming and the time for his blessing is there, but he's also saying that it's not perfect yet. But he is saying that there are some who are perfect or who are locked in the church. There are some inside who have not defiled their garments. There are some in this church that are worthy, that walk with me in white. So he's drawing these distinctions out and saying that this is a group that still has some good things to it. And he's promising that the world will know who they are. So in the terms of the old time church, this is one of those churches that has a lot of good things going for it, even though it's not a perfect group, but it's also a rather bland, fractured, flat group. There's not a whole lot that they're doing forward because they're obsessed with other things. More than likely, this would have been more of a working church when people came to the, the church to actually associate themselves with the Roman governorships uh, and that sort of thing to, to interact with the uh, the leaders on political matters, this is where they would have been housed. Now, when we bring this out and we remember ourselves that we are looking at these churches in terms of the broader time frames as well, we put this church rather interestingly, and David will jump on me because I'm already defying what Fred and what the, to some degree, the Adventist church teaches. We put this church between 1563, where we ended the last one in the, with the Council of Trent, 
and some other time period in the future. The Council of Trent was the one that actually established the counter to Martin Luther's 95 Thesis. It was the established group when so much had come to a head that the church had to actually respond. So in 1517, when Luther published his thesis, the buildup of pressure that had started to be, to be getting to this point now broke its banks. And the English Reformation of 1529 just forced the need to deal with something. Now, the Fifth Lateran Council had closed a couple of months before Luther nailed his, his thesis to the Wittenberg Cathedral, but it was a peace treaty. It wasn't anything important. There was no um, theological powerhouse that had been re-established for quite a while before this. With Henry VIII's break from Rome, uh, all of a sudden uh, you have this major influx of people that suddenly get a authority center and a recognized respectability center that they can flock to that can be anti-Rome. This had not really happened before. You'd had the schisms, uh, but those were cultural. Now you have in the Christian world a Christian power identifying itself with all the Christian groups suddenly protesting, hence the name Protestant, protesting against these things. And this was the first time since the Arian heresy that we saw persecution on that massive scale. Um, Henry VIII, of course, broke from Rome. His son uh, introduced a new prayer book. Edward introduced a new prayer book. And then Mary, his, um, his sister, when she became queen, she slaughtered uh, wholesale. There was massive levels of um, of, of uh, Protestant heretics, about 300 were burned, and these are recorded in a, a fellow named John Fox's Book of Martyrs. In 1588, uh, Elizabeth I openly favoured Protestants, and while she tried to be more tolerant, she did put a lot of Catholics to death herself. Um, her reign ended in the early 1600s, um, and of course Shakespeare wrote through most of her reign, but the statistics for her are a bit mixed because there was a number of Catholic rebellions in England. So now you have these situations where the popes are excommunicating English monarchs and these protesting groups start to come into play. When Pope Clement VII took over, he saw that there was a need to actually address these issues. We have to actually do something itself. But it wasn't for quite a while until 1545 that the council was actually open, able to open. Uh, by that time, between 15, uh, as I said, as I, I've got it here, 15... Um, uh, 17 and 1545, those 30 years had enough time for the Protestant movements in Europe to sit, lock themselves down, to really become academic and really become um, fixed in. So because there was a conflict between the Holy Roman Empire, France, and in some internal conflicts there, there wasn't any chance to actually get a council going until 1545. It lasted until 1563. And three of the five popes during that time managed, but as part of, interestingly, as part of the rules that was set down as a, a agreement with the Protestants for their participation, was that the popes would not actually be present at the council. Pope Paul III, Julius III, and Pius IV were the ones who managed it. The other two popes, Marcellus II, who was only pope for 22 days, he died of a stroke just after he was coronated, and Pope Paul IV was anti-Protestant. So in the middle of this council, you had this massive anti-Protestant movement that stopped things from happening. And this is sort of where you get that time frame. Again, this 50-odd year period between, the end of the, uh, between Martin Luther and the end of the council when decisions are made, where by that time, everybody is just locked into place. Everybody seems to really have a, a, an understanding of where they're going to be. Originally, the Protestants wanted to speak. And Martin Luther himself was supposed to was, actually was very encouraging and calling for a council. Modern um, movies would try and make you think that Martin Luther was very anti-councils. What actually he wanted to do was to have a council to decide how to deal with some of these heretical things. He was very pro-councils, and he's the one who encouraged Charles V to bring the council together. But by the time the council started, things were so persecutiony that there was now a point where the councils really couldn't take place, where the Protestants really couldn't take place. It's also noteworthy that the French actually boycotted almost the entire thing until the last year, because the French had their own wars of religion going on. The French had their own uprisings uh, amongst their own people. 
So the doctrines and teachings of this church that were supposed to be debated here were effectively debated internally by the Roman church. And the Council of Trent really brought down what no, what everyone expected, this conclusion that the Roman church had always been right, and it secured and locked into place a lot of its teachings. Primary amongst their discussion were things like what is biblical canon, what defines sacred tradition, how original sin is defined, and the justification and sanctification rules that we still use, as well as the sacraments, mass, and veneration of the saints. They did little more than rewrite and reaffirm in a much clearer way everything the Fourth Lateran Council did. So this is what the Council of Trent came to. And this was the last big time that there was an actual opportunity for theological debate and discussion between Protestants and Catholics. This was the shot that was handed to these guys so that they could actually have an open, honest, free debate and discussion. And it was the last real shot fired in the theological war, and both sides botched it. Martin Luther's people didn't attend. They had no interest in going, and they had a big fear of persecution. The Romans were not encouraging and were not warm to them. And from that point until the First Vatican Council in 1869, the only development was the concept of papal infallibility. This was the last real theological evolution of the Catholic Church, and even Vatican II only reaffirmed what this council decided. Does that make sense? Are you with me on this? Mm, yeah. yeah. With that Queen Elizabeth I, yeah. she killed uh, the reason that she killed a lot of um, Romans, I'll put it that way, like yep. religion Catholics, yep. wasn't it because Mary Queen of Scots was Catholic? That's part and of it. She, she also wanted, she thought she was the rightful queen. That's a big part of it too. Mary Queen of Scots was seen as the heir because she was Henry VIII's uh, grand niece. She saw her Catholic throne as being a viable contender for the English throne. She yeah. was absolutely Catholic, as you said, and she led a French army or a French army in her name invaded from Scotland, um, most of whom were Catholics, and they were killed. But the problem about calling that persecution of Catholics is it's an actual rebellion. So yeah. your problem with actually saying that this is a, a persecution of the Romans is it's a rebellion that's being led for a, a political uh, force. Reason. But you're absolutely yeah. right. They, she thought that she could try and take the throne and she lost her head for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So when we look at these things, this is, this is where the theological conclusion ends. So this church really starts in 1563 when the Council of Trent was closed. And if we look at the way this church is treated in the Bible, it seems that things simply plot along. What we find from the historical perspective is things for this church pretty much just kept going. This is when we have these, these two sides, Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, more or less just hammering along and developing in their own way. Protestant, Protestant churches started to look at um, the different ways that they could in, in, in engage their theology. The Roman church was happy with where it was, but the question that came to these two groups was, how do we now deal with this situation? If the Roman church wanted to make a major move, their big option was a crusade. And if they were going to do a crusade, they were going to be crusading against very powerful people in Europe that nominally were supposed to support them. The Protestants, on the other hand, were too fractured to have any sort of centralized group, so the Romans wouldn't even know really who they were putting the crusade against. The last major war, the Thirty Years' War, was a, which was sent around a war of religion, in part of the Peace of Westphalia, two very complicated treaties that established a lot of things and were insanely overly complicated. But one thing that it said was that the Catholic, the princes in Germany especially, and the princes around the world that were included in the treaty, were able to choose the religion for their subjects. The Holy Roman Empire was no longer a Catholic empire. So the ins ins that instigation by um, Charlemagne in the first place now has moved into a space where the Holy Roman Emperor is no longer going to dictate the, re the religion of its church. So from this point forward, what we call the Reformation more or less ceases. And the Reformation is no longer an actual 
thing because nobody's trying to reform the church anymore. The church is now separate from the Protestants. And if you want to protest against the church, you become a Protestant. If you don't want to protest against the church, you stay as a Catholic. So the scale and the size of what actually happens here sort of splits. And what we see is that it's not until 1798 when the when the, uh, the, the, the the papacy is decapitated, as we've discussed, and we'll go into it in a second, that there's not a lot of development and change between in either of these sides. And we don't see any developments in the papacy really until Vatican II in the modern world. So that Jezebel heresy that we talked about in, in Pergamum was simply fixed. The Protestants were... In, engaged and as far as this church is concerned and i'll go to the other form here as far as this church is concerned i know that some of you have heard some of you hold fast repent some of you are white with me but not everybody and your works are not perfect before god even those who wanted to reform the church didn't do it very well and didn't have the intellectual capacity in a lot of places to be able to actually step up Matters come to a head, however, when we look at how this continues to affect the Roman Church. Because from that point, Protestantism, and especially in the light of the Peace of Westphalia, Protestantism becomes an alternative viewpoint for a particular leader who wants to choose something else to do. So if a leader wants to be Catholic, they can be Catholic. They can absolutely be a Roman, and the Roman Church will support them. However, if a prince doesn't want to align himself with Rome, or if he's opposing people who are aligned with Rome, it becomes a, a politically expedient to instead say, no, I'm going to align myself with the Lutherans, or I'm going to align myself with the Calvinists or somebody else. It becomes politically expedient for, for them to say, I'm no longer going to align myself with you, I'm going to align myself with another group. That causes a very distinct and sharp decline in the influence of the papacy. Because now when the Pope says, well, I'm going to excommunicate you, the generals or the general of the king simply goes, yep, so what? I don't care. So leading to this, we have this decline in, uh, in movements. And you have this progressive pulling back from the Roman area. The French, when they start their revolution, um, starts to have this big political decline, uh, big uh, decline in its uh, ability to support the, um, the, the Roman church and to be able to protect the Roman church. And matters come to a head in 1798 when Pope Pius VI is captured by General Berthier. Napoleon and um, Berthier both move into, uh, they, they were both, uh, sorry, the Pope uh, protested somewhat feebly against the persecution of the Gallic Church and the confiscation of the pontifical possessions in France. But France's fractured state and its a strong military pretty much made these inconsequential. And then France did something that nobody had ever dreamed of. It became an atheistic state. Nobody had ever done that before. This was the first time in history that a state actually abrogated itself completely from religion. And they set up their own uh, central uh, rational system that replaced Roman religion or religion altogether. And because of that, now any influence that the Pope had as a, as a spiritual leader meant nothing. So it was all based on their temporal power, which was mediocre at best. And so when King Louis the, ex, the, uh, the, the 15th, 16th was executed by guillotine, Pius VI tried to make them martyrs, but there was so much that was going against them that it just never really happened. And then Pius VI made one massive misstep. He called monarchy the best of all governments which alienated all of the Italian republics in the north. So by 1793, the papacy was not only alienating the French, the largest power on earth, it was also alienating all of those organized groups that surrounded them. Um, the, in 1791, the French had conquered, uh, the, the, had ended diplomatic relations, and they had taken on Avignon, which is where the popes had lived for quite a while. And in 1796, under the command of Napoleon Bonaparte, the French invaded and occupied the north of Italy. And Pius had a peace treaty, but it only lasted for a little while until Berthier marched into Rome on the 10th of February, 1798. At that moment, supposedly in the presence of Pius, he declared the Roman Republic and he was escorted from the Vatican to Siena and then to Cortessa near Florence. 
and his journey was supposedly extremely harsh. Napoleon himself set, sailed from uh, Toulon to Malta, and on seven, 19th of May, 1798, uh, he actually arrived. By the time the 11th of June came, the Maltese simply failed. Uh, simply fell to him. And the, me the deadly wound we discussed in Daniel was finally inflicted on this date, the 11th of June, 1798, when the Pope was in chains and being transported to the north of Italy, when the, the, the formal uh, uh, force that had uh, any military value to the papacy was simply shattered, and when the influence of the papacy was non-existent. No church, no group on the face of the planet would come to his aid because he had alienated everybody that could and everybody that wouldn't was going to fight France because they were monarchies fighting another group. So this is the moment when this church and this organized papal group really ends. This is when Jesus says, I will come upon you like a thief. You will not know what hour I come. He's being quite literal here. He's meaning this in a very literal sense that you're not going to know just how quickly these things are going to move. And as we, as you, you look at back through history, the movements on the Roman church were incredibly swift from the French perspective. It was not unreasonable, but it was an incredibly swift move. And in that short space of 150 years, the papacy went from central to the world to absolutely and, and utterly destroyed. So this is where this church really ends. And at the end of this church, we have some interesting changes that have to come in when we talk about the Church of Philadelphia. Um, I'll jump back. Any questions on that group from leading up to that point? So, James, you mentioned that this is at least the timing that you've attached to this uh, church is different to what Fred would have said. Yep. So how does his view... What does he say? He puts it to 1792 when there is a uh, rather important Anglican priest uh, preaching certain sermons in uh, England. Um, those sermons are against the, the papacy and they lead to these events. But I don't think that they are really dramatic enough or important enough for it to be the overall conclusion. Because this is the end of the church and not a simple minor development in Protestant theology, I think that this fits a lot better to the way that the churches mix in, especially with what we look at in the next church and how the next church addresses itself. And does the um, Adventist scholarship go along with Fred? The Adventist scholarship sort of jumps between the two of them. I mean, so we're only talking seven or eight years. Yeah, we're not yeah. talking a long time, no. No. One, in, one, in one space, you're talking about a spiritual church. In the other space, you're talking about a political church. That's the difference. Okay. There's no, there's, no, right. there's no spiritual destruction here. The French that moved in, they, were spir they spiritually, by this time, by 1798, they were starting to discuss uh, 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 emancipating the Catholics. So the spiritual destruction had already happened and had come back. Um, whereas by whereas the, the physical destruction was clear. And this also matches better with the remainder of the, the, um, the prophecies we study, such as Daniel 8 and Daniel 11. So I think that this matches better with the time frames that are set up in other parts of the Bible. So this um, ties in with the end of the 1260 days, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Are we good? Can we, we move right to move on? Yep. I, as far as I'm concerned, yep. Yeah. Cool. And this is why I'm, I'm saying this, because we've got to look at this next church. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things say, and this is really unusual, he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the keys of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your work. See, I have set before you an open door. No one can shut it, for you have a little strength. Have kept my word, have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. <clears throat> because you have kept my commandment to preserve, I will keep you from the hour of trial which will come before the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. 
I will write on him the name of my God and the name of my, the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, the word Philadelphia literally means brotherly love. There are four words for love in the Gospels, and Philios is one of them, which literally is the, the love that I have for you, pair, the love that one has for a brother. It's not agape, the love that God has for us. It's not eros, the love that you two have for your wives. And it's not, um, um, what's the other one? The, fam the, the familial love. Um, yeah, family, filial, isn't it? Is it filial? Yeah, filial. Yeah, yeah, but this is it. So the, the, the church in Philadelphia literally means brotherly love, and it's today a city called Eleazar. In AD 17, there was a massive earthquake, and Emperor Tiberius relieved it from having to pay taxes. By the 3rd century, under Carcavula, it had developed an imperial cult, and it was a coining city. It was a city where they uh, manufactured money. The coins that it had bore the word Necaron, which literally means the temple sweeper or the caretaker of the temple. Now, there's some interesting stuff that we have to look at with Philadelphia. It's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. It's the only place, as far as I understand it, that this church is mentioned, is here. And because an imperial cult grew in a place when Christianity was supposed to be strong, we can deduce that the church group there was either very small or was simply not influential. It was unusual for a place where Jesus said, I've opened the door to you. I will open things where, where I open things that no one can shut. I've set before you an open door. Either this is a very strong encouragement to proselytize or something else is going on here. Now, when things moved west, Philadelphia became a very prosperous Byzantine city, and it was known as Little Athens in the 6th century because of its festivals and temples that worshipped uh, Greek, predominantly Greek-based uh, cults. Presumably, this in indicates that the city was not converted to Christianity in any strong way. But about the year 600, uh, the, do the domed uh, Basilica of St. John was built, and you can still see the remains of it there today. Apparently, they're next to a bus stop. This city was captured by the Seljuk Turks in 1074, and during the First Crusade, it was recovered by Alexius Komnenos, who was the same Alexius that actually sparked the First Crusade. We talked about him last week. Mm -hmm. The authority reference here is where things get dramatic. This is an authority reference we have not seen before. We This is not in Chapter 1. Jesus says, these are the things who is, says he who is holy and he who is true. Now, both those qualities are mentioned in Chapter 1, but not those words. Jesus is not addressed in chapter 1 as a holy person or a true person. He's certainly given the credibility of it, but they're a little bit less uh, specific in that way. He who has the key of David, David is not mentioned in there, and David is a rather interesting character to bring into the to this story now. Why is David having keys being brought in in this place? So let's consider what these words mean. David was, of course, the second king of Israel. He took his rise from the fallen king when Saul was abandoned by God, and he became the darling of Israel. Even today, we talk about the Star of David being the Israeli um, uh, symbol. Oh, this is the sorry. No, you're right. Keep going. <clears throat> yeah, this is the, this. David is the darling character of Israel, and he's still held up as the exemplar of Judaism. He conquered Jerusalem. Jerusalem was his city. It was the city of David. And this is where this reference to keys is most likely. It's most likely that it's a reference to him holding the keys to access that new Jerusalem, to get access to the new city that is being set up. But of course, Jesus is a descendant of David. So to have the key of David also indicates Jesus is royalty. Jesus holds noble power. He can ennoble anybody he chooses, and he can make people who are noble um, uh, low because he has access to the king. So his nobility is also tied up with this key of David concept. He opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. That is such a curious phrase. What are we opening here? Is Jesus giving open opportunity for these people to proselytize to the to the um, groups? Is this the opportunity? This is a, an authority and a credit that Jesus is that's broader than Jesus has given in other places. He's saying that when someone, when he opens an opportunity to someone, he's the one that is opening it. And also when it goes away, he's the one who's stopping it. 
When we add in the keys of David, as I said, this is most likely using those keys to open and close the gates to heaven. Jesus is also the exemplar of Israel, so we need to consider that this is also membership of the Israelite group, but it's also this new Jerusalem. However, owing to their G's, Jesus also rewards and punishes those. So not only can he open the opportunity, but he also has the open opportunity for people to excel and better themselves, to change their lives and change the way they're doing things. This is one of those churches that have full of opportunities. And clearly as we look at this, it has many challenges too. Right? But those challenges, for each of those challenges that it has, this is an opportunity too. You've got an imperial cult where everybody is worshipping the emperor. Great, turn into a Christian leader. Make that Christian leader the, the focus of the cult. Make the Christian part of that the aspect. This is a center of coinage and minting. Mint coins about Jesus. Put Jesus all over your coins. However, the problem here is that According to history, none of these things were done. We clearly see that none of this stuff actually happened. And unfortunately, that's a big problem. However, it's noteworthy that only this is one of only two churches that has no reproof. There's no challenge to this group. There's no nobody saying this group be doing the wrong thing. So this is a prosperous true church that has many, many opportunities. However, there is a risk that they can lose what they hold on to. Hold fast to what you have that no one take your crown. Hold fast to what you've got that no one strips it from you. Because of the temptations that come from a prosperous group where there is a, a, a bunch of cults and because there's a lot of these sorts of discussions, you are at greater risk of falling down and having these same sort of problems. So this is where you have that issue. And when we consider the local group, it's obvious they're a small group, but they're obviously a faithful group. It's obviously one of those groups that's really tight. And it's interesting the way that Jesus talks about these groups. He says, uh, wait, no, that's Laodicea. Sorry. Why did I put myself there? Um, anyway, um, he's, he's, it's also interesting that by the 6th century, this church had done little proselytizing, so Jesus doesn't call them out for this anti-proselytizing. It seems that we can see that this is one, how quickly one of those churches can simply fall back into their Roman ways. This is one of those churches that could be very quick to flip back. Even though Sorry? they're doing fantastic work, this is one of those churches that has that higher risk of simply slipping back into that synagogue of Satan where his strength is no more, where his name is no longer, it is actually denied. Did you want to jump in there, John? No, it's okay. Marilyn was just saying something in the background. Okay, cool. Now, the blessing is also a tremendously strong one, and it's, again, a really unusual one. It stretches clearly into the next church as well. He who overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God, he shall go out no more. Now, that's a multi-layered, curious phrase. There are, st are you still, you guys still there? Yeah. Oh, I am. Oh, I think John, I think John just muted his mic. That's okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm here. Just in case Marilyn said anything else, I didn't want to corrupt you. That's all right, mm -hmm. no problem. It takes a lot to corrupt me. Um, <laughs> I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. What a curious phrase that is. Firstly. Jesus is calling it this his temple and his God. He's talking about being himself as high priest. He's the one who's administering the temple. How else can he make the pillar? But he's invoking this idea that this is the reader is reminded of their duty and the place at which Jesus has at the center of their life. Now, we were going to get a lot more into this um, uh, imagery of the temple and the imagery of, of, of Jesus as a high priest, especially uh, in our Paul study when we come to the book of Hebrews. But this is a focal point where Jesus is saying that this is his God. He's once again bringing that supplication language in. He's bringing that supplication group to it. However, this is a new temple. Remember, shortly before, maybe 40 years before this was written, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. There is no more mm. temple. There's no more building. So Jesus is establishing a new spiritual theological structure. 
that is able to be established and these are the people who built that modern church now we have learned from them and there are so many characters that are in that exist uh, during this time frame which we're going to talk about william miller charles spurgeon william booth that changed the entire dynamic of christianity when we get into this church's time frame and this church relates from 1798 to 1844 prior to 1844 we've already discussed william miller william with miller. the great disappointment yeah. merger Charles Spurgeon was a fantastic preacher running through England telling everybody that Christ was coming, that he was a theological dinosaur, reinventing how to think about theology and how to think about the message and covenant of Christ. Spurgeon was one of the most magnificent preachers who ever lived because he was able to bring people to a realization and a conviction that Jesus was a personal savior. While William Booth did none of that, he set up the Salvation Army. He created the establishment where you didn't need to think about theology. You simply need to worship. You simply, uh, simply need to work for Christ. You allowed yourself. If you're not a theological dinosaur, don't worry about it. Jesus can still be good for you. And it's more important as well when he says, "They he shall go out no more. These are the people who will spend the eternity in the presence of God, but they are already living like that. They're already part of that. He's stipulating these are those individuals that have no fear of eternity they are not afraid of temporal punishment they are secured and i will write my name i will write on him the name of my god the name of the city of my god the new jerusalem which comes out of heaven from my god and i'll write on him my new name we've seen this sort of language before already but it ends with this common promise of salvation but not just to replace the individual as being a a human but also bringing in this future tense of, being, of, of one who will save everybody in the future. He's saying that I will be given a new name. Jesus himself is saying he will be given a new name because the title of Jesus will have to change after the second coming. After the second coming, Jesus is no longer savior. He is the savior, the savior. He no longer is the savior in the future sense. He is now the one who has saved. He is the, and then we become the part of that saved group. So this is the promise that's indicated here. And these new keys of David are keys to be able to get that sort of group. Now, <coughs> the question when we talk about time periods and we talk about the modern church, in reality, 1798 is a really, really good spot because we can clearly see from the destruction of, of Rome and the conquest of the Pope that an open door is there. There's no longer anything restricting the Protestant movement from expanding and blowing up over the whole world. And what's more, the destruction of the papacy in this moment doesn't end there. Things get worse for the Roman Church, if you can believe it. In 1798, the papacy was wiped out but the decapitation of the Papal States left the Pope homeless and penniless. The French troops raided the, the, the whole of the papacy. They stole all but one of the Papal tiaras. And when Pius VII was elected in 1800 and coronated in exile in Venice, the only paper tiara was out of reach in Rome, so the Venetians put a paper mache tiara together and they decorated with jewels donated by the local families. So the, the Pope, when he was crowned in Venice in 1800, was actually crowned with a paper mache um, uh, tiara made out of paper and glue. That's can you get to a point being more humiliated, right? This is the dev, the absolute destruction, the humiliation of the papacy. Well, actually, yes, you can, because when Napoleon finally became first consul, he get, gifted the Pope an elaborate tiara. It was decorated with 3,345 precious stones and 2,900 pearls. That's what it looks like today. It's a traditional papal tiara. It has the three bands representing the Trinity. It has a white velvet um, uh, cassock. There are three layers of uh, this is solid gold. Uh, at the top of here is a massive emerald, but when he gave this to them, it was an insult in the most brutal ways. For example, it was too small. The actual crown of the head was too small for it to sit on the Pope's head. This uh, emerald here was actually one of the emeralds that Pope Pius IV, the VI had removed to pay war reparations from the Treaty of Tolano. So the, the, Napoleon is saying, I'm so rich, I can give you back your own jewels because they mean nothing to me. What's more, this thing weighed almost eight kilos. 
Now, that's a lot of gold for Napoleon to give to the crown, but it's impossible for you to wear that on your head. St. Edward's crown, the heaviest of the, uh, the English monarch's uh, jewels, gave King George V tremendous headaches just after the coronation, and it weighs two, two kilos, and most of the um, papal tiaras weigh around a kilo and a half. So this thing was an insult on every layer, and what's more, where we today have images of Peter and these sorts of things where you have these spots in the center, they were originally emblems of Napoleon and his, his um, bees, reminding the Pope of who had conquered him and who had put him in. This was an insult in gold. This was an insulting measure. But it's not the end of that. When, his, when Napoleon had his coronation in 1804, to separate himself off from the previous monarchs, Napoleon moved the ceremony from Rams Cathedral to Notre Dame. And then he changed a whole bunch of stuff about the ceremony. After the Pope's arrival, he then had to use chism, which was myrrh oil, instead of the catacombs oil, which was blessed by the Pope. The placing of the oil on the head was on the head and hands rather than the right arm and the back of the neck. The prayers were changed. Napoleon himself was seated for most of it. He didn't kneel down for most of the ceremony. And not wanting to uh, be an old regime, the king said he is to inherit new ideas in a geology, a, a genealogy. Now, during the coronation itself, when Pius was reciting the Roman Accupe and the French um, uh, court deus, Napoleon picked off his own laurel crown, took the crown of France and put it on his own head. Then he took up Josephine, his wife's crown, touched it to his head and coronated her. The Pope did not crown Napoleon. Now, while this was agreed to before the ceremony, and it's not as big an insult as most Protestants like to make out, the Pope is still there giving prayers, saying to him, I'm going to crown you in the name of God, while Napoleon puts the crown on his own head. And Napoleon would later say, I found the crown in the gutter and I picked it up with my sword. So this is the probably the most dramatic insult you can end up getting. And by general, by 1808, things had just fallen to, to down so badly that they were actually at war again. On the 1809, um, uh, uh, Napoleon issued a couple of decrees, and by the time um, 1814 comes around, the Napoleon had invaded, and the Pope had actually been in confinement again. Um, he was in confinement for six months and uh, six years until uh, 1814, when the Hungarians freed him. And again, the Pope was brought back to Rome. But in a final remark on the situation, um, the, 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 the Pope wrote a letter to the British, the head of the Protestant group, saying he is no longer a danger to anybody and we would not wish him to become a cause for remorse. So these cutting lines that come between this are just so dramatic and the Papal States don't recover from this decapitation in 1798. While the Congress of Vienna restores the Papal States, they are restored under rather complicated groups of troops. And by 17, 1870, the Lateran Treaty, by 1870, those troops have all been removed. And the when uh, Italy becomes a republic again, and Italy becomes a nationalist republic, um, the, the Pope is more or less a prisoner in the Vatican. Uh, from the 11th of February, 20, no, uh, sorry, from the 20th of September, 1870, the Pope doesn't leave the Vatican. So the Pope is now locked in the Vatican as what he calls a treaty in the Vatican. In 1929, the Lateran Treaty formalized an arrangement with the uh, Republic of Italy, then the monarchy of Italy, and it set up the uh, Vatican City as a state that we have it today. And today, the Pope is the last elected absolute monarch on earth. Anything he says in Vatican City goes. He is a dictator in Vatican City, and he has diplomatic relations with 183 states, including Australia. We have an ambassador to the Holy See. So the, the, the sheer climb down between 1798 and 1870 
is absolutely incredible of how much the Pope can fall down to the point where he's not even technically allowed to leave Rome. So the connection here between this open door that no one can shut is absolutely clear that this is God's law resurrecting itself. This is God saying to these people, "We're able. you're able to go out and do things now. The Protestant Reformation can start. Go nuts. Have fun. Spread. Get everybody out there. Right? Jesus congratulates those who have kept the command to preserve and all of the laws, including the Sabbath keeping laws, are able to be opened up. He turns and says the promise, he will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come in the whole world. Jesus opens this door and this is where we have that link to Daniel 7, 9 and 11, which establishes these time frames for the Roman church to take back seats and affairs. The papal um, destruction that was inflicted by France is really one of those key things where we see that synagogue of Satan and those who say they are Jews but lie end up coming and worshipping before your feet. The papal, papacy finally had to actually step in and supplicate itself to both the uh, atheistic power of France and the uh, more or less Protestant independentist power of Italy. Right, the, the power of Italy that was certainly not set up in any sort of religious group. And from that point, the only religious war we really see was the Crimean War, which was over who was going to protect Christian minorities in the Crimean area, right? whether it would be uh, a Turkey or France. And that's the last of these wars. Now, religious language was used in almost all of the last wars, the Franco-Prussian War, the World War I, World War II, the Cold War, uh, the German Wars of Unification, the American Civil War. They're all presented as holy crusades, as holy matters on both sides, but there was no theological backing. There was no theological connection to them. This door that opened was that the, the, the papal threats of excommunication, any papal condemnation, or condemnation by any other leader, Protestant or whoever, if our president, if the Adventist president was to say, we're going to condemn Joe Biden because he's a Catholic, everyone would go, so what? The same way that if somebody, if the Pope was suddenly to excommunicate uh, Joe Biden, everyone would go, yeah, that's something for him to worry about. So this is where we have that really big down step in actually this church, this church's movements. What becomes difficult with the end of this church, however, is this concept that he has to con uh, he has kept this command to preserve, and that draws us into a problem of actually identifying the end time frame for this church. The end time frame for this church is given as a connection to the final judgment. You have kept my commandment to preserve. I will keep you from the hour of trial, which will come upon the whole world. So this indicates that the movement established at this point is the way things are going to be more or less until the judgment time. And the people living through this time are loyal to Jesus theore theologically, and they are as established as those in the last days. So this end period we have here, and I put it down to 1844, becomes a problem. Now, I'm going to hold off on explaining why I use 1844 for a moment. It is still what Fred and the Adventist Church use. But uh, we'll go in, if it's okay with you, I'll, if there's any questions on that connection there, we'll go into the Church of Laodicea before we go to the end period for this church. But as you see, the open door is there for this church because of the, uh, the downfall of the papacy and because of that movement into that group. Now there's no longer any fear about, you know, being persecuted from 1798. The open door is there for those who keep his word and preserve to be there. So we have that as an ongoing thing. And really Philadelphia and Laodicea represent the church of the last time. But I'll, I'll discuss that, that that end point in a moment. Uh, are there any questions with Philadelphia in that way? No, not in that way. No, uh, it's all good. No. All right, so Laodicea, let's jump into Laodicea and then we'll, we'll, we'll go back and have a look at the, the separation between these two. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hot, cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, blind, poor, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich and white 
and white garments you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and, that I, and I anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on the throne. And I also, and I also over, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the seven churches. So Laodicea was founded in 260 uh, along the Lycos or the Couscous River, which is why it's called Laodicea, often called Laodicea on the Lycus. And it's not the capital but it's sort of the primary city in Anatolia, in the same way that Sydney is the primary city of Australia. Canberra's the capital. Sydney and Melbourne fight over which one of those two cities is the more important. The city was founded by Antiochus II when he was king of Syria, and it was named in honor of his wife, Laodicea, but it was originally called Disopolis, the city of Zeus. It was a massive center for manufacturing clothing, and the sheep that grazed around Laodicea were famous for their soft black wool. Um, it was one of those big centers of that sort of production, and it was a very, very big, uh, important trading center. As I said, it was on a crossroads north-south between Sardis and Perga and east-west between the Euphrates and Ephesus. Um, so this made trade easy uh, from sorry, the Euphrates and Ephesus. This made trade easy, and it was a very, very rich city, a very rich city. Um, one interesting thing is when you talk about the School of Medicine, this reference to eye salve is one of the things that was actually very uh, widely uh, done by them. They had developed a sort of brick that when you powderize and put a little bit of water in and put on your eyes was supposed to help with um, uh, a whole bunch of different eye problems. So eye salve is actually something they were known as. And two of the Laodicean uh, doctors were so famous they actually appeared on coins in the city, Zaxus and Alexander Philates. Now, in AD 60, shortly before the um, invasion, they there was a massive earthquake that pretty much destroyed the entire city. But the, the city was so rich, they refused aid from the empire and rebuilt the city off their own wealth. Tacitus said one of the most famous cities of Asia, Laodicea, was in the same year overthrown by an earthquake and without relief from us, recovered by its own resources. So we're talking about a fantastically wealthy city. But it had some big challenges. It was entirely dependent on external water, mostly coming from either the hot springs at Heriopolis just six miles across the Lycus River, but also piped in from Colossae, cold water piped in from Colossae. Now, we're studying Colossians at the moment, uh, and we're going to see uh, in chapter 6 where references to Laodicea are brought in. Uh, but this mixture of hot and cold springs meant that the lukewarmness of the, of the water uh, made it putrid. So this is a reference, again, there's a very timely reference to these hot springs that would have carried good bacteria and thrived, that then met with the cold springs, cooled it, allowing them to die, and then bad bacteria to eat it, making it rather disgusting. And there's a reference here from another archaeologist. Now, the Christian community in Laodicea was very closely connection, connected with that of the Colossae, um, and Laodicea is mentioned four times in Paul's letter to Colossians. Sorry, we're in Corinthians, aren't we? Sorry, that's yeah. my bad. Yeah, my bad. Um, but he's sent, Paul sends reading, greetings to a fellow in there. So it's one of those cities that has a close association, and it's possible that Paul even set up the church in Laodicea, um, although we're not 100% sure on that. There's, there's some discussion debate about it. Um, the reference uh, in Colossians, in one of the letters, I think it's uh, uh, Ephesians, um, that says it was from um, uh, uh, Laodicea may actually mean that the book was written from Lost Laodicea to the Ephesians, although Tertullian suggests that the uh, letter that we have to the uh, Ephesians may actually be an apocryphal book called uh, the Epistle to the Laodiceans. It's clear that there was a book written to the Laodiceans, but it has been lost to time. So nobody really knows what it says or what it was talking about. Some people think that it's what we today call Ephesians, but I don't. I think Ephesians was written to Ephesus. Nevertheless, it was a strong Christian community. They were a steadfast Christian community, and there was a council in Laodicea between 363 and 64. What it actually decided is not very well known. The records have more or less been lost, but the Council of Chalcedon in 451 mentions it and drew very heavily from it. So we know that there was a council in Laodicea, so it was one of those important things, and it's today even a titular see of the Roman Catholic Church. So 
It's one of those churches that actually has a title amongst the Catholic bishops. Uh, and several of the disciples, even Timothy, uh, ended up in Laodicea. This is the end of the list of churches. And so Jesus presents himself as the Amen. We remember that when we said Amen is the certainty of faith. So Jesus is identifying himself with this church as the fact of the faith. And he's also calling himself the faithful and true witness. And his reproof of this church indicates that he knows what is going on. He is the witness to their decadence. He is the witness to what they what is happening to them. He's clearly setting himself up as one who's able to be certain and fixed in what the church wants to believe. But he also includes this phrase, he is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, that doesn't mean God was created. He's saying that he has the power as a witness to bear witness to what they are doing in the same way and to the same structure that he bore witness to the creation of the world, which he, of course, did. So he sets the things in motion. These things that the church is going to experience, he sets them in motion. And that's a good thing and a bad thing because he doesn't really give it any presence. There is no commendation for this church. The church is evidently has little good about them. But the reproof is strong. They are wastrels. They are pathetic. You are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and nation. There are harsh. These are harsher words that's even used against Thyatira, where everyone's committing, uh, where everyone's committing fornication. But they are not the least deliberate churches. It's a lukewarm church. It's neither hot nor cold. They can't make decisions. It's a church that can't fix itself down to something. They can't accomplish anything. They can't do anything. They think they are rich. They think they are wealthy. They think they have need of nothing. And Jesus is just bluntly disgusted by them. He wishes that they were because he can't even reproach them. They're such a pathetic bunch. Jesus can't even work out what to tell them off for. He hates, he can't tell them all off for being on fire and, you know, being too enthusiastic for new things because there's so many cold fish in there that are content to just sit back and wait for his return. Because he can't tell them off because there's too many people that are on fire to spread the message. Now, both these, of course, are negative and positives. Those who are cold and stubborn temper down and relax. Those who are really fiercely on fire and those who are unyielding and unshakable are able to encourage those people, but they also can bring in new ideas. They can, because they're out there proselytizing, getting new people in, those new people sometimes bring in new viewpoints. So Jesus can't do anything with them. He says, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I'm so upset with everybody that I just can't do anything with them. And when he says he's going to vomit me out of his mouth, that's the mouth that has the two-edged sword. Both sides are right and both sides are wrong. He's making it very, very clear here that these are the groups that are in, that both sides of these groups are in trouble. But the warning is, and the encouragement is, that they should buy gold from him because buying gold on the open market is dangerous. It could be worth nothing. This is where they should buy their gold from. Buy gold from me, tried in the fire. Get your wisdom from me. Get your understanding from me. Get your profit from me. The word gold in the old, in the old Greek is not necessarily physical uh, holding your hand gold, it can also be interpreted to be wisdom. These are people that have to be careful, but not, uh, but, but to, to actually aware that about what gold they get. And Jesus comes in as a very parental and fatherly figure here. He says, as many as I love, I also rebuke. I, I'm not saying this to upset you. I'm saying this because I want to encourage you because just as much I love you is why I want you to do better. And you find this, I mean, you know, you, you, you'll you have people as an electrician, David, when you're working with people and you're trying to teach them something, you tell them that they're doing the wrong thing. You try and encourage them, not because they're doing the wrong thing completely, but because you want to say to them, look, if you do things in this way, you're going to get a better work of it. Am I right? Mm, right? Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you do things in this way, it's going to be easy. It's going to be quicker. You're going to get a better result. That sort of thing. So he's not saying, I'm just doing this because I want to tell you off. He's acting as a father here and as a mentor figure saying, I want you to come and get better and get better at everything. And this is one of also contains one of the most powerful blessings in the scripture. I think it's my mother's favorite verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to dine with him and he with me. This is the ever-present promise of salvation. But at this time, 
it's a deliberate act. There's a deliberate chosen act that this it has to be done here. He is standing there going, can I come in, please? Hello. You have to make the choice to actually open that door. And for a church that is so lukewarm with so many different choices, he's saying some of you are just there because you want to be there with other people. You're not there letting me in. <clears throat> the way that this has often been interpreted, the way that this has often been connected, uh, is actually interesting. And if you, this is a picture that's um, sitting in St. Paul's Cathedral by William Hunt. This is the most famous uh, way of depicting this, where Jesus is presented as a crown, uh, as a king arriving at night. And this door is always, almost always presented as having no handle. You have to open it from the inside. Jesus can't open it even if he wants to. In this particular case, in this particular example, um, the, there are reeds also growing in front of it, indicating this person has been outside for a while, but also indicating that Jesus has been there for a while. He's saying, I will stand at that door and knock as long as you keep that door closed. I've opened doors before for you to come into. All I'm asking you now is for you to do the same thing for me. So this group that we have here is a very blessed group. It's a profoundly blessed group, but it's also a prof profoundly um, self-destructive group. They are hot and cold. They are internally squabbling. They have so many of these sorts of problems. And this is where we find that the church today makes a lot of sense about that. We often use this as a self, um, um, what's the word, um, self-derogatory phrase to refer to our church because we in our church are very um, um, internally conflicted. But it's, this really applies to the broad church across the world today. From 1844, this church, the, the, the churches around the world have more or less had all these sorts of groups. There are Assemblies Gods and there are Baptists that go out and they spread the word um, to the whole world as much as they possibly can, but have limited theology, limited understanding of Revelation, limited understanding of this stuff. There are those of us, like in the Adventist church, who have solid information about this, but don't go out and cross the ties, who don't feel it comfortable to go and talk to our friends. Since World War I, the place of God has really taken a massive step back in society in general, because people can't have gone through that experience and still believe in a God. And I fully understand where they're coming from there. It's a very, very different approach as to... Um, where before everything you did had a God focus to now have a much more um, uh, self focus. And the phrase God moves in mysterious ways simply becomes the catch all phrase for anything you don't understand. Now, our church is not immune to this. We have many Sabbath to Sabbath Christians that attend as a mark of status rather than as a mark of faith. We have many of our ministers who like to get up there and, and pomp themselves up, who preach good words but don't understand what they mean. And then there are some who just like to um, uh, go out and, and, and do things the right way and instead get hurt, hurt for it. Those of us who actually study the Gospels and anyone who preaches the Gospel um, are at a very, very risk of being proved human. And as soon as any small fault is found, it's hammered in by anybody else that can make a political point about this. That's about as much as I want to say on that particular point. But, you know, we, I'm not drinking any alcohol at the moment, so we're not going to talk about the, the nature of how people attack people all the time. But this comes to a center of something called humanism. Humanism is the way that we can interpret this modern, um, modern approach of this lackadaisical attitude towards everything. Humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without theism or any other spiritual belief affirms our ability to be responsible to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. It's not theistic and does not accept a supernatural view of reality. So the idea of humanism that came in and that is a very heavy view now uh, relies on replacing the God with the self. The idea that you are able to accomplish anything that you set your mind to. It's important to note that humanism has no salvation in it because they reject the concept of God. So there is no need for salvation if there's no God and no Satan. But this humanistic self-reliance is one of those things that has permeated the Adventist church, all churches, the Roman church, for the past hundred years or so, 
and is the one central central um, development and becomes important in other chapters of Revelation that shows us this increase uh, this this increase in a lack of need for God. If I can do it, why do I need God on my side? If I can be there and understand it, why do I need God on my side? So like John Tetzel when he when he said, they're trying to do whatever you can to be able to present uh, yourself blameless before God. On the other hand, those who uh, put the study into the Word of God realize how quickly and how easy it is to present oneself as no longer needing the world around you because you are simply devoting yourself to God. So this two-edged sword that comes into play here is if you put yourself out there for God and you spread the Word, you can realize that because you have God in you and because you have a humanistic streak in you, you can make up things that come from outside. You can invent law. You can invent interpretation to suit your own purpose. Those of us who are inside the theological um, dome, we can quickly realize or think that we don't need to rely on God. We can rely on what he's taught us. And I'm certainly guilty of that too. So the land of sin imbalance is between a lot of these sorts of elements. It's between the Roman church and the Protestant church, which is now equally powerful in the eyes of everyone. It's between those who want to proselytize and those who don't. It's between theological groups and those who have uh, uh, those who have uh, on, on fire are on fire for God as evangelists. It's between the, the if you want to put it at this core, it's between the Adventist Church and the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army believes that everybody has a work to do, whereas the Adventist Church believes in the message. These are the massive contradictions where God is separated between these two groups. And the Laodicean Church, as we have seen it for the past 150, 170 years, clearly imbues that demonstration. And that's what I would say the Laodicean principle is. Now, before we go into this transition, do you, is that clear to you guys? Is that where we see the church today? Yeah, it sounds fair enough. So when it, when you, I reckon, even reading it when I was reading it before, and it says like they're hot and they're cold, yep. uh, and I'll spew you out of my mouth, isn't it you're either for him or against him? There's that's, no sitting on the fence. That's absolutely an element too, yeah. you. Some people in the church are all for God in one particular way. They're all for him in, in, in wanting to go out and proselytize. They're all for him in wanting to study and preach. They're all for him in something else, but they don't want to do the other parts of it. They don't want to, you know, some churches just throw, say, no, proselytizing and going out and preaching the word is in the too hard basket. I don't want to do that. I want to sit back and study. Whereas other groups, I don't want to understand what is in the Bible. I just want to go out and spread the word of God. And then when you get questions, you don't know how to answer them. So you're yeah. absolutely right. It's, it's on that both sides. But, I mean, God saying, Jesus is saying he would prefer that they be hot or cold. But in fact, they're not. They're lukewarm. Yep. I would rather that you make a choice and either just devote yourselves to scripture and study so that I can beat you about the head because you're not going out and preaching the word. Or that you would ignore all the study, ignore all of the other stuff that comes in, so that I can beat you about the head about not knowing enough. But I can't do either things at the moment. And there's so, and this is multi-layered. There are so many of these other things that come in. You know, we we'll talk in a moment. There's two more sections we're going into. We'll talk in a moment about the law, and there are so many churches that accept the law, and so many churches that don't. There are so many churches that accept the the Protestant faith, the Protestant movement against the Roman Church, and have walked away from Rome. And there are so many that that haven't. The, the Roman Church has got its own offshoots now. There are many Adventists who, you know, different Protestant groups have different layers of realigning themselves with the old Jewish faith. Some, most still go to church on Sunday, whereas we don't. Mo some still have, uh, most don't, but some still have Mary at the center of their church. Most accept the saints in various degrees of, of, of recognition and support. So there's so many things that the modern Christian groups all events that Jesus just can't beat them up about it. Hmm. Yep. That makes sense, John? You with me or not? Yeah. yeah no, that's, that's good. So yeah, it's let's... just like, even though they believe in Sunday and all like that, yep. there's still going to be people from that church that are going to be... Absolutely. Absolutely. ...be resurrected. Yep. I'll get, I'll get to that in a moment, but you're abs there are absolutely are. And, and let nobody tell you that the people who lived around the Roman times or are, are, are under the Church of Rome are going to just going to not be awake. 
Yeah. Now, mm. uh, let's let's go into so this transition between Philadelphia and Laodicea is an important one because that's one of the things that makes this so difficult to analyze to to um, uh, delve into. Now, when we look at the Christian movements, we can clearly lay down what they are up to the Church of Sardis. Ephesus and Smyrna are the innocent. Ephesus is the innocent church, right? It's the church that is prudent enough to not trust everyone, but it's still trusting. Then uh, Smyrna is the one that de evolved into a large enough group to be a threat to society and became persecuted. Pergamon is the one that betrayed its message. Thyatira is the one that just plodded along and evolved, but it was obsessed with tiny politics. And then Sardis showed that downfall to that conclusion. Now, during these times, and this is where we fall into this, this thing, which is what you're talking about there, David. During these times, the first two churches especially, the majority of the Jewish law was maintained. And members, matters like Sabbath were rarely questioned. Under the third church, under Pergamon, that's when the value structure of the church changed. And the most famous of the groups that broke away during this time of the Waldenses. In 1173, we've talked about the Waldenses, but in 1173, Peter Waldo formalized the Waldenses around uh, himself and around his movement. But they had claimed to have existed for several hundred years before that. Those claims are difficult to prove because when the Crusades happened in 1215, they burned all the documents. They destroyed everything. The temptation to draw on the broader, broader Protestant Reformation was practically irresistible. And with the resolutions of Carfanon on 12 September 1532, they became a part of the Calvinist group. So the, Re the Waldenses themselves sacrificed their Sabbath truth along with their sovereignty. <clears throat> the problem we have with these churches in general is too many people like to believe that they are simply the church that stays loyal to God, and they're not. They, they simply cannot be. We, When we focus on the Sabbatarian movement, you can read books like Truth Triumphant by Wilkinson to gain an understanding of how widespread the Sabbath truth was. However, when you look at groups like the Waldenses and then the Protestant Reformation, you certainly have this recurrence of going back to Jewish law, but basically from Smyrna onward, nobody is doing it perfectly. And even the Adventist church is not keeping to Jewish law, Jewish tradition. We still debate the difference between the Mosaic law, the moral law, the civil law, the uh, uh, festival law, and all those other different groups about where we should be centering ourselves. So the rise of the Protestant Reformation certainly brought the groups back to its, its roots, but Seventh-day Adventists and then Seventh-day Methodists were the first to bring that Adventist group into it. So to decide where we have to put this church in, we have to decide where, firstly, those opportunities really came to a conclusion <clears throat> and what grew from them. And then we also have to decide uh, where the church started to simply lock itself down into this hot and cold situation. And to do that, we can go back to our Daniel roots and have a look at what we've drawn upon in um, Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 has these statements. It says, Out of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great, towards the south, the east, and the glorious land. It grew up, up to the hosts of heaven and cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground. He, the little horn, exalted himself as the high prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away. The place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now, we've already identified this as the Roman church, and we know that this is the Roman group. And because of his transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices. He cast truth to the ground. He did all this and prospered. And a holy voice came and said, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. When we go through these, and we've already been through these sorts of analysis, we say that the opposition of daily sacrifices in Rome was the intro introduction of priestly and saintly intercession. The truth was cast down as practically all Jewish law and custom was destroyed. The place of his sanctuary was cast down, which where, the, where the veneration of Christ was replaced with the veneration of Mary. And the, the hosts, the Roman church had absolute domination of life 
over the entirety of the civilized world. However, what we see from 1798 when this prophecy is concluded is the open opportunities to bring that Protestant Reformation and bring that Protestant group back to a more Jewish-centered or a Old Covenant way of looking at things. Protestants, for example, return Jesus as the only necessary intercessor. For the most part, some of the Lutherans still have um, intercession, or should I say... Um, um, uh, priestly confession, but most of the Protestant churches now hold that Jesus was the only intercessor. Everybody is reexamining the way the Jewish law engages and, and interacts with the validity and, and its place in the culture. There's some mixed results about that. The Adventists, of course, bring the Sabbath in in a big way, but everybody's reexamining things. The saints are generally seen as the worthy of respect, but they are not put in the central place of the sanctuary very rarely. And Mary veneration of Mary is almost completely unseen outside of Catholic Church and Catholic offshoots. And the free thought and steady reducing of the fear of persecution was culminated in 1798 when the papacy finally lost all of its power. So these are the Jewish laws that we can talk about, the Jewish customs that were related to this central, central group in Daniel chapter 8. It wasn't just, it was all of these things, not just the physical locations that we discussed in, heavy, in a heavy way, but it was also the nature of what the sanctuary meant that was cast down by this Roman power. And as the church expanded and moved out, we were able to see that this layer, to, that this um, this group, the opportunity that opened was for the groups to return themselves progressively back to the Jewish ways of doing things. We like to paint the Reformation wholesale as being this big movement towards um, a new way of thinking. But really, it's a big movement back towards an old way of thinking. It's a movement back to what the original church was. It's a movement back to that sort of thing. The last mm. of these laws to be destroyed by Rome, uh, the, 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 sorry, to be revived, revived after it was destroyed by Rome, the one that seems almost the most ignored, and the one that has its place in the Ten Commandments is, of course, the Sabbath truth. Sabbath. Mm. Yeah, and this is this is something that's going to be very, very important as we move forward in the Book of Revelation, which is why it's a central theme here. William Miller, of course, we talked about the Great Disappointment. One of the big things that came out of that <coughs> and out of the Millerite movement was this revival of Saturday Sabbath thinking about the Jewish law. The Sabbath is, or at least can be seen to be, the final element of this sanctuary being resurrected. It's the final part of his sanctuary that was cast down that is restored. So it's not just the sanctuary, but also the host, the groups and the actions that are given command. How long is the vision concerning both the intercession for our sins, the transgression of everything that is established, but also both the physical churches and those who attend them to be trampled underfoot? This line here, the sanctuary and the host, the connection between them, has to be related to the practices of the individuals that are going to church, the practice, practices of those who either commit or break the Jewish law. And this is why I establish, especially, and this is what the Adventist church established, that the 1844 revelation allowed Sabbath keeping and Sabbatarianism to become that central point. And that's why 1844 is that marker between the two churches. That's why it's being used in that way. It's the last of the Ten Commandments. It's the last of those those moral laws that are restored to distinguish these groups for Christ's return. Now, the reason that that's important is because of the Church of Laodicea. This connection with lukewarmness, I'll go to the other thing here. This connection with lukewarmness is not just about this um, this, this, uh, these, these guys being rich and poor. It's not just about all this. It's also about this idea of the law being restored and of the 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 uh, sanctuary being cleansed. When the law is restored and people are able to go back, this is a central point where these people are actually able to say, "Okay, we will return to these true practices." Almost any Protestant theologian who is worth their salt that you talk to will tell you that the Saturday Sabbath was absolutely the Jewish tradition and that it was changed without any real reason by Constantine and then Justinian. 
It doesn't matter what theologian or historian you talk to, if they have any basic understanding of how the history has worked, and I've established that through the evidence we've seen here in the last study, any historian will tell you that that is a fact, and any theologian will tell you that if you're keeping to the Ten Commandments, you should be keeping to the Sabbath of the Jews. It doesn't matter what Protestant group you come from, and even some Catholics, they will all tell you the same thing. Yet, the majority of Protestant churches still attend church or worship or have their day of rest on Sunday. Again, as we see here, Jesus is saying, I know your works and you're neither hot nor cold. Why are you doing this thing you know is wrong and still doing it? If your theologians tell you that this is the right way to do things, if they're able to discuss it, why aren't you actually making that change? I wish that you would just decide you're going to do it rather than debating it. Because I can't stick with you when it comes to this point. So this, and, and I'm not saying this is the only interpretation, but these are so multi-layered in their readings. Jesus is saying here, even the fact that you have come back to that Jewish point, you're still holding out on me. I wish that you would come, you've gone so far. You're spreading the word everywhere. You're talking about it. But you just aren't making that final choice. I'm standing at the door and knocking. I'm begging you. You've just got to open the door. I overcame. You can do it too. So the Sabbath truth is not the only truth of the Laodiceans, but it is that marker that separates those who truly follow all of God's law from those who don't. And the conclusion of this that I'll put in is that that leads into the end time for this church, which has two answers. And frankly, I think you're irrelevant which one you have for it. One is the second coming, and one is what we call the close of probation, which is when the, 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 the extension of salvation on earth is no longer available because Christ is on his way back. That is the point where there's no more decisions to be made. Which one of those you choose as this end point is irrelevant because by that time, everybody who has made that choice, made the choice to open the door to him or not, is open to it. So that's when I, I put the end time of this church. And, you know, there's no point in having a church after the second coming. But it's that thing that goes into that group that is alive and remain at the end time. Does that make sense? And, and it, I know that's a lot there and that's a really deep study. But is there any talk on that? <clears throat> hey, a lot of reading. <laughs> John, I can feel I can feel your brain I can feel your brain processing the, the idea of the Sabbath being heavily engaged in Laodicea when we don't preach that very often, but do you agree with me on that? Uh, uh, the, I, I just I just love the depth uh, hey, and down, mate. the Can I give you a ring back? I'm just on a Zoom meeting. All right, mate, I'll give you a call back in a minute. Okay, bye. We're almost done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> this identifies um, the need for the pure gospel message to me. I mean, the, we're seeing so many people that are are wrong in so many directions that, um, you know, you can't really necessarily even address them all. you just got to simply say, well, what is the pure message, that message yep. that was back there in Ephesus. Um, and to me, that's the remedy for the the sickness that is portrayed here in, in these uh, churches, in particular the last couple. Mm. Um, so we just need to make sure we understand the gospel as it really is. Yeah, that's right. Now, now by way of Sorry. conclusion, I, do, I just want to draw one very, very clear thing out, which is something David hit on again before. You cannot use these churches to identify who is right and who is wrong at any one time. These churches do not identify the truth or the liars. They do not identify the good and the bad. They identify the experiences of the Christian movement throughout time. You can say that such and such lived at a time of the church of such and such. But you can't point to a particular group and say they are the church of such and such. That's a fa that's that's a misconception. That's a, that's something that's useless. We can say that our church exists like the Laodicean group, and we identify ourselves with the Laodicean experience, and that's a common connection. 
but, but it's just one of those things that we can't do. Now, the reason I say this is it's become an article of faith among Adventists to put groups like the Waldenses in as the mark of their faith because of the Sabbatarian truth. I don't agree with that in any way, shape or form. The Waldenses were trying to keep to the Sabbath truth and were certainly trying to keep to the, uh, the, the truth as defined by uh, the, the Jewish law and not go, fall into that Jezebel fornication. However, they had their own problems. And this is a movement, this is what defines that the, the church as a whole. And this is where you get to that one conclusion, that phrase that Jesus reminded us in the previous chapter. I am he who searches the minds and hearts. I will give to each one of you according to your works. There are Catholics that were living in earlier times that had no experience of the concept of the Sabbath or anything else. And this book was written, these, these churches letters were written, so that people could take a step back and say, oh, maybe we're doing the wrong thing. But of course, people couldn't read, and then the churches were blocked away from doing things. And so when you went to church and you prayed to Mary for an intercession because you didn't know any better, Jesus isn't going to say, oh, you were praying to Mary and therefore you're wrong. Jesus is going to say, were you trying to stay faithful to what I wanted to teach you? If that's the best you had, then that's the best you had. So this is where we have to be very careful, and we've done too much judgment of those earlier churches, that the Bible, while it teaches that these things were wrong, the people had no access to that. And Jesus is the ultimate judge. He who hears the message of the churches, let him hear and remember. <laughs> now, you know how you say, like, in the end times, you don't know, like, some people will be, like, I'll, I'll say me, studying. I study it, but I don't preach it to anyone. So, therefore, you're not one, but you're the other. But how can you preach it if you don't really no, it's not. It's not about that. What I mean is, you you don't. It's not about whether or not you simply preach it or simply study it uh, or simply do one thing or the other. It's about where your attitude is towards it. I, why are you doing the, the question that comes to you, David? Is why are you doing these studies? Why are you letting me waffle on to you for an hour and a half today, just boring you, boring you silly about things that happened a thousand years ago? Are you doing it because you want to get closer to God? Are you doing it because you want to get closer to his message? Are you doing it because you feel that this is something you can do? And then what will you do with that? What will be your experience with that? I'm not asking you to answer these questions, obviously. But yeah, yeah. The question, you have to think about this and say, am I spending my time when these opportunities arise? Am I actually putting myself out there, running the risk of saying, yes, I am a Christian. Yes, I believe in this stuff. And I'm exposing myself to possible ridicule and possible damnation from my colleagues and friends, but still I'm sticking to closely to what God's word is. It's not a, the, the distinction is between those who are just devoting themselves to study or just devoting themselves to evangelism. And Jesus says it himself, he says there are still those who have white garments. I still uh, he says it here. Uh, yeah. I still have um where am I? Uh, there are still a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. There are still people around that are doing the right thing, and Jesus is simply saying, I'm standing at the door and not. You guys just need to come and do the right thing. So it's not about, you know, we're studying, therefore we're wrong. It's what are we going to do with this? I'm putting these on YouTube, not because I want the glory. I'm trying to disguise my face and name and everything else because I don't want to get fired for it. But I want this to be available to people, and I want people to come back and talk to me and ask me questions and say, James, you think you're completely wrong this way. So it's it's that sort of what attitude do you have. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. John, you okay? Yeah, you've done a great <clears throat> great job, man. He has. Done an excellent job. There's a lot of there's a lot of information in there for you guys to go back and look at, and I expect more questions in the future. There will be more <laughs> questions that must be answered. But we, this is the core of everything that happens from this point forward is what uh, John has set up the rest of the book to be. So that's where we end there. So let me let me have let me end with a prayer, and then we will. We're obviously not here for next week, but let me end with a prayer, and we'll do it this way. Heavenly Father, no we thank you this afternoon that we can come together and discuss the last of your churches, and we thank you that we can talk about what you have guided us to. I pray that you will guide and direct everyone that hears these messages. As you said, everyone who gets a, hears what is said to the seven churches is able to get a blessing. And I pray there's a blessing for anyone that does read this book is able to understand it. 
and you and I, we pray. Amen. Amen.